Hello there, this is Amy Coppage from Chesapeake Marine Training Institute. And today we will be doing a presentation of Rules of the Road uh, using the Rules of the Road Handbook published by the Coast Guard. And the purpose of the video today is to uh, introduce the rules, um, particularly to our students to help them prepare for the U.S. Coast Guard exam here at Chesapeake Marine Training or uh, if they're testing at the Regional Exam Center, uh, or for others that just might be interested in learning more about uh, the rules of the road. So we're going to be referencing the handbook, so if you have that, please follow along with us. And uh, just kind of give you an idea of how we're going to tackle this, I'm going to present rules of the road in four different sections, mostly because uh, it makes it a little bit easier for students to take a break in between but also it's kind of the, the method that we teach it here at the school. So we're gonna stay consistent with that. And <clears throat> we're gonna um, cover the rules in a sense that we are preparing for a US Coast Guard exam. So although there is a lot more information in this book that may not be covered in these videos, um, that is more for you to read on your own and get comfortable with that material. But I'm gonna focus on passing a US Coast Guard exam or the exam here at CMTI. So let's get started. So the Navigation Rules Handbook um, plays a major role in preventing collisions at sea. And it goes back into the 1800s where uh, ships uh, were sailing the seas and eventually uh, we started having propulsion and so ships were going faster, which caused a lot more collisions to happen. So we needed to have some method of determining uh, who has the right of way, uh, what type of vessel it might be, what direction they might be going. And so these rules came uh, about initially in the international community uh, by way of the 72 call regs, which is the international rules of the road and followed uh, next by the United States in the 1980s, they introduced the inland rules of the road. Uh, all of these rules came from smaller rules that might've existed in the past, but those rules were uh, improved and revised over the years and now we have the final revision, which does get some updates here and there, but generally these rules have been in place for quite some time. So we're going to start with rule number one and in the rules of the road handbook, um, I'm on page two and three. Now, if you look in the book, you'll see that on the left hand side of the page is the international rules and on the right hand side of the page is the inland rules. Now, there are times when uh, which side of the page I'm on matters, but in this particular case, uh, generally I might be on the international side, and if there's something different that relates to the inland rules, I will point that out. But if it's more of just you know very similar or the exact same rule, uh, it doesn't really matter which side of the page that you read from. So starting with rule number one, rule number one is the application, like who do these rules apply to? So the rules apply for international waters. It says these rules shall apply to all vessels upon the high seas and in all waters connected therewith navigable by seagoing vessels. And that's kind of a fancy way of saying that uh, anything within our territorial waters generally uh, outside of the demarcation line for separating inland and international rules, we would consider that uh, the high seas and the international rules would apply. Now, Jump down to uh, letter C, and in letter C it says, nothing in these rules shall interfere with the operation of any special rules made by the government of any state with respect to additional station or signal lights, shapes or whistles, signals for ships of war, and vessels proceeding under convoy, or with respect to additional station or signal lights or shapes for fishing vessels engaged in fishing as a fleet. These additional station or signal lights, shapes, or whistle signals shall so far as possible, be such that they cannot be mistaken for any light, shape, or other signal authorized elsewhere under the rules. So what they're saying there is that there are some other lights that might exist for certain applications. So for example, um, they talked about the government of any state. When they, when they say state, they mean country. So in the United States, for the U.S. military, particularly the Navy, uh, government vessels can show different lights. For example, they show two pulsating red lights for a man overboard. Uh, they may show red lights for aircraft warning lights when they're uh, launching and recovering aircraft. Uh, they may show um, 
uh, underway replenishment lights. They may show wake lights or uh, lights that might be used in a convoy. And those are all authorized, but they're not going to be particularly li listed in this book. So just know that generally the rules uh, do cover everything that you'll see out there, but there are some that might appear, or you may even have a ship out there, a government ship that doesn't have any lights on and because they're doing some type of war games or preparation for an exercise. So there's some differences that might exist, but generally everything's going to be in this book. Um, the other one they talk about is uh, fishing vessels engaged in fishing as a fleet, and that does exist. And there is an annex in the back that talks about fishing vessel lights and signals that they can use when they are fishing as a fleet. For example, uh, we're in Virginia, and not too far from us, we have a company called Omega Protein, and they um, work together to uh, fish for bunker fish, Menhaden. And so they may have the, the larger steamer vessel and they'll have smaller purse boats that go out. And back in the day before we had a lot of really good handheld uh, communication or uh, radios, uh, they could use lights to signal when they're launching the nets out, when they are uh, drawing up the nets, when the nets are stuck on an obstruction and so on. So that's a method for the steamer to talk to the purse boats to be able to communicate what's going on. Um, you don't see that used very often, if ever, but they are authorized in the book, and we'll talk about that later. One thing I do want to note at the very bottom of this page here, you'll notice there is a footnote <clears throat> that discusses submarines, and that's very important uh, because there is a test question or two that talks about submarines, and it says submarines may display as a distinctive means of identification an intermittent flashing amber or yellow beacon with the sequence of one flash per second for three seconds, followed by a three second off period. So when I think about uh, this submarine signal, the first thing you have to remember is that it's yellow. So I'm gonna write that up on the board, okay? So submarine uh, flashes a yellow or amber beacon, which is basically yellow. And then it said that it had a three second flash and a three second off period. So how I remember this is like SOS, right? Uh, dip, 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 right? So yellow, 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 da, 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 which is O or Oscar. And that would be off, off, off. And then it goes back to flashing again. Dip, dip, dip. So this is the letter S in Morse code. So that's how I remember submarine. Submarine is, uh, begins with the letter S and so does the flash pattern is three yellows. So I like to use that as a memory aid to kind of figure out the submarine lighting. Just remember that it's yellow um, and it does not flash consistently because there's another vessel that flashes more consistently yellow. We'll talk about that later. On the inland side of the rules, there is another uh, note that's very important. It's letter A under rule one. And in these, uh, the section for inland, it says, these rules shall apply to all vessels upon the inland waters of the United States and to vessels of the United States on the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes to the extent there is no conflict with Canadian law. The one thing to remember about inland rules specifically, uh, and especially for the test, uh, the inland rules do not apply in Alaska. There's just so many areas where it would have to be divided up that there was determined that they, the, uh, the state of Alaska and all of its bays, lakes, tributaries, and all that would just follow the international rules of the road. So that's, that's a very important note that the inland rules do not apply in Alaska. And there's a few other places in the United States where there's some um, tricky situations, but that's just kind of a blanket statement that they do not apply in Alaska. So we're going to turn the page to uh, page five. And I use this page because it has a little extra information. And I'm on letter E. And it says, whenever the secretary determines that a vessel or class of vessels of special construction or purpose cannot comply fully with the provisions of any of these rules. And now it talks about all of the different things, the number, position, range, or arc of visibility of lights or shapes as well as the disposition and characteristics of sound signal appliances, 
the vessel shall comply with other such provisions in regard to number, position, range, arc of visibility of lights or shapes, as well as the disposition and characteristics of sound signal appliance, as the secretary shall have determined to be the closest possible compliance with the rules. That is a lot of like uh, legalese. And it basically is saying that if this vessel is constructed uh, for a special purpose, and it cannot put the lights where it's designed to be based in the back of the annexes here. Um, she can um, put those lights as close as possible. And then the next sentence is very important. It says the secretary, and we'll talk about who that is later, may issue a certificate of alternative compliance for a vessel or class of vessels specifying the closest possible compliance with these rules. The Secretary of the Navy shall make these determinations and issue certificates of alternative compliance for, for vessels of the Navy. And that's kind of a, a great point to meet and give an example. Um, imagine an aircraft carrier, okay? She has a big flat top uh, deck where you land planes. So obviously we would not want to have a masthead light in the center line of that vessel where she lands planes. So we need to make sure that we put those lights as close as possible to the center line, but out of the way of where it would be dangerous to land those planes. So then that vessel would say, okay, this is what we did with our lights. And they would apply for the certificate of alternative compliance, and that would be issued. And then they would keep that with their documents if they ever had an inspection to show that they had that. Well, it's the same for civilian vessels. Maybe you have a supply vessel where you carry cargo out to an oil rig and you can't have your lights spaced out like they're supposed to be. So you would apply for a certificate of alternative compliance. And if approved, you would keep that in your records and you would uh, carry those lights, shapes, sound signals, and so on as closely as possible to what's required. Just remember that document is called a certificate of alternative compliance. And then if you jump down to letter G under the uh, inland rules on page five, it says the operator of each self-propelled vessel 12 meters or more in length shall carry on board and maintain for ready reference a copy of these rules. So if your vessel is 12 meter more, you're supposed to have a copy of these rules on board. If you look back, briefly at Roman numeral IV in the front of the book here, you'll see a uh, measurement table because in the United States, we typically follow the imperial units. And this book uh, was originally um, tailored off of the international rules and they use meters. So when we say a 12 meter vessel, it's about 39 feet. So we're using about 3.3 uh, feet per meter when we think about these rules. So make sure you can do some mental math to kind of just get your mind right as far as how big these vessels are that we're talking about. Okay, so now we're going to look at rule two. And rule two is the responsibility rule. And letter A says, nothing in these rules shall exonerate any vessel, owner, master, or crew from the consequences of any neglect to comply with these rules or of the neglect of any precaution which may be required by the ordinary practice of semen or by special circumstances of the case. So what they're saying here is, is that everyone on board uh, is responsible for doing things that make common sense. Like if you're up on the bridge and you're talking to the captain, that both of you would be looking out of the window and paying attention to what's going on. You can't just say, well, I didn't know I was supposed to be doing that, right? We have to make sure that everybody is doing what they're supposed to do in compliance with the rules. And letter B says, in construing and complying with these rules, due regard shall be had to all dangers of navigation and collision and to any special circumstances, including the limitations of the vessels involved which may make a departure from these rules necessary to avoid immediate danger. So this is kind of the rule, because remember, these, these are laws for the inland side, particularly, and these can be used in court. So what this is saying here is that you cannot use the rules as a defense, meaning you continued to the rules and you had a collision with another vessel, and you're going to say, well, the rules told me to do that. Well, you may at times need to depart from the rules to avoid a collision. For instance, if someone's backing out of a slip, 
there's really no rule that tells you who would have the right of way there. You have to have common sense. Or if a vessel has to back down a waterway to get into where they're going to, that's not really covered either. So sometimes you do have to make a departure from the rules to stay safe. And that's what they're addressing there. I don't really know that there's any questions regarding rule two, but it is important to understand. Okay, so we're going to get into rule number three, and I'm going to clear my board here real quick. So rule number three has a lot of information in it that is very important. And when I say very important, I mean in the sense that they're defining the types of vessels and defining the different uh, things that might cause us to take notice later when we talk about lights and shapes and sound signals. Because when we think about the rules of the road, the first thing that comes to mind is just a power driven vessel. That's what we're used to ships, boats, recreational vessels, and so on. But there's a lot more out there. And what this book did was it defined those vessels so that we could set up rules later to avoid those collisions. So the very first one we're going to talk about is the word vessel. And if you look on page six, um, I'm on the general definitions rule three. It says the word vessel includes every description of watercraft, including non-displacement craft, wing and ground craft, and seaplanes used or capable of being used as a means of transportation on the water. So a non-displacement craft would be something like a hovercraft or something like an airboat, okay? And then you have a wing and ground craft that's kind of like a seaplane. It flies close to the water uh, using surface effects to keep itself above the water to fly. And then obviously we know a seaplane lands and takes off on the water. So when we say vessel, we mean anything that can be used for transportation but it needs to be a practical means. Like we're not talking about someone on um, a raft made out of logs. That's not a vessel, even though it can be used for transportation. Letter B, power driven vessel means any vessel propelled by machinery. Okay. So power driven vessel, I'm going to abbreviate that PDV powered by machinery. Okay. Power driven vessel means powered by machinery. That's very important. She cannot have anything else going on though. And we'll talk about why later. A sailing vessel means any vessel under sail provided that propelling machinery, if fitted, is not being used. So when we say a sailing vessel, there are some sail vessels that have a small engine to maneuver better or if they lose the wind, but to be considered a sailing vessel, she has to only be using the wind under sail. So we're going to write sailing vessel, and that is under sail alone. Okay, No engines, not even teeny ones. The next one, letter D, a vessel engaged in fishing. Now this is a tricky one. Okay. So listen to these keywords. Is any vessel fishing with nets, lines, and trawls? So if I had my own book, I would underline or highlight that so that it stands out to me, okay? Nets, lines, or trawls, or other fishing apparatus which restricts her maneuverability, but does not include a vessel fishing with trolling lines or other apparatus that do not restrict maneuverability. So I'm gonna write this down and then we'll talk about it. So fishing. And sometimes I summarize, even though there's a little bit more, but mostly what I uh, put up here is the important part for understanding it or for the test. So fishing is nets, lines, and trawls, but it does not include trolling. So if you're a charter boat person and you go out there with rod and reel and you have you know four or five people out there fishing and another vessel comes close to you and you might be required to take action to avoid a collision, you could do that. You could cut the line. You could just bring in the rods. You could, you know, toss them overboard, worst case scenario. Um, but you could maneuver to get out of that situation. The reason it doesn't fall under fishing is because you still have maneuverability. Where we're talking about fishing vessels here, we're mostly talking about like commercial vessels. Maybe you have 
long lines out 100 miles or you have dredge nets out uh, or some other apparatus that keeps you from really being able to maneuver your vessel. And it might be doing a full circle to get out of a collision, whatever it is, or stopping and your nets might get caught up in your propeller. So that's why fishing is nets, lines, and trawls because it's more than just a fishing pole. So when we think about fishing, and you're on a charter vessel that's using rod and reel, you are considered a power-driven vessel. You are not considered a fishing vessel. That's very important to remember. Okay. Now, the next one is a seaplane, which is common sense. Uh, any aircraft designed to maneuver on the water. Okay, we're good to go with that one. Now, seaplane is a vessel. Remember that. Because you may have a question that asks which of the following is considered a vessel. A lot of people miss that because they don't consider a seaplane a vessel because she's in the air. Well, that's true, but she does land and, and take off on the water. So she is considered a vessel when she's, she's doing those maneuvers. Uh, letter F. Now, this one's very important. Okay, letter F. Uh, the term vessel not under command. We, we abbreviate that NUC, NUC, not under command, means a vessel which through some exceptional circumstance is unable to maneuver as required by the rules and is unable to keep out of the way of another vessel. So I'm going to write not under command. Okay. I'm going to get you used to seeing these letters. Not under command. Okay. Means through some exceptional circumstance she's unable to maneuver and i'm abbreviating okay now how i remember this is it says through an exceptional circumstance they mean something really serious right so i change that and i say through some engineering circumstance now is it always engineering no it means that you have some sort of loss that is keeping you from maneuvering as you normally would. So some examples, loss of steering, loss of propulsion, uh, dragging anchor, um, any of those where you don't have control of the vessel could be considered not under command. So this is what we would generally refer to as a breakdown, the breakdown rule, right? And I say through some engineering circumstance, uh, and it's not always engineering, but it's an easy way for me to remember. And I like to use things that help me remember uh, the rules, especially if I'm trying to take a test. So not under command means that you are unable to maneuver as required by the rules due to some exceptional circumstances. Something bad has happened and you can't maneuver. Now, that does not mean that you can't maneuver at all. And I'll give you an example. I was on a ship at a time we broke down and we were, you know, a thousand miles away from the nearest land and we were not able to make much propulsion, but we were able to make two or three knots. So we were able to make headway, but we weren't really able to get where we needed to be. So we had a tug come out uh, to tow us in. And in the meantime, we proceeded towards the direction of where the, the uh, ocean going tug was going to come from. And we continued a little bit on our journey. Now, could we maneuver to get out of a collision situation? Probably not. So we did show not under command, even though we were making way. So once you understand that not under command doesn't always mean that you're sitting still. It could mean that you are, you know, just limping along trying to get where you're going. So not under command does mean something exceptional, typically a, a loss of something. Now the next one, letter G, is restricted in her ability to maneuver. This means from the nature of her work. And we always abbreviate this one, R-A-M, restricted in ability to maneuver. So I'm gonna do the same thing. And this is due to the nature of her work. Okay. This is work related. So if you took a second and stopped to think, what type of work is done on the water? Well, they give you a lot of examples here in the book. Engaged in lay laying, servicing, or picking up a navigation mark, submarine cable or pipeline, a vessel engaged in dredging, surveying, or underwater operations like diving, a vessel doing underway replenishment, launching or recovering aircraft, mine clearance, 
And then uh, VI says a vessel engaged in a towing operation that severely restricts the towing vessel and her tow and the ability to deviate from course. So a couple things to remember that restricted ability to maneuver is due to the nature of her work. So it's some kind of work related activity going on out there. Um, she may or may not be underway. Okay. Um, and it could include a towing vessel. And that's an interesting one. Now, a lot of uh, people think about the towing industry, they would think automatically restricted in billing maneuver. Um, that's not always the case. So if you're on a tug and you're uh, carrying a barge on the hip or pushing ahead, uh, you may not be restricted in ability to maneuver. If the captain decides to claim that, that's totally fine. That's what that captain feels. Uh, if you are towing something like one of my ships, we towed a, a big ship to another place. Uh, our ship was smaller. We towed a monstrous uh, aircraft carrier. Uh, we were definitely restricted in ability to maneuver. So we claim that. So towing is not always restricted ability to maneuver. And remember, it's up to the captain to decide if they want to claim that or not. And it's totally fine if they do. But remember, on the test, if you see a, a vessel in a picture with maybe a barge behind it, that's just a power-driven vessel unless they tell you that it's restricted in ability to maneuver. Don't make assumptions that aren't told to you. That's a big mistake that people do sometimes. At the bottom of the page, H, it says a vessel constrained by her draft means a power-driven vessel which because of her work, oh, excuse me, because of her draft in relation to the available depth and width of navigable water is severely restricted in her ability to deviate from the course she is following. So constrained by draft, we typically would uh, show as CBD, okay? So this is draft related. So when I think about constrained by draft, I think about cruise ships. Uh, cruise ships always go to really fun places like islands, maybe in the Caribbean. Uh, and then around those islands are typically some reefs or shallow spots. So a cruise ship might uh, show constrained by draft to indicate to you that uh, she cannot alter course or she will run aground. So she's kind of telling you, get out of my way so that I can proceed safely throughout this shallower area where I'm operating. Now, one thing to note is that constrained by draft is only on the international side. It does not appear on the inland side. Uh, for inland waters, we do not recognize constrained by draft and we handle those situations differently. So we're in um, Virginia, so we have Norfolk uh, close by and Thimble Shoal Channel is a main uh, channel of transit for lots of ships, container ships, uh, military ships and so on. But what they do, for example, in that uh, channel is they restrict that channel to vessels that draw uh, 25 feet or greater. And so uh, that takes care of those smaller vessels kind of getting in the way of those larger vessels. And then other times the, um, the, the uh, vessel traffic service will just close down the channel overall to other traffic so that it remains safe for those very large uh, post Panamax ships that might be coming in. So we handle it a little different in inland waters, but um, so there is no constraint by draft for inland, but there is for international and it's draft related. Now, uh, the next page, I'm going to be on page nine because it is going to give us a little bit more information than what's on the um, international side. So it says uh, the word underway means that a vessel is not an anchor made fast to the shore or aground. So when we think about underway, this means that she is not attached to the earth in any way. And so we have to differentiate though, because I can be underway making way. I can also be underway not making way. And that's very important because if I am in the fog moving, I need to sound a certain signal. But if I'm in the fog drifting, I'm going to sound something else. So it's very important to understand whether you are underway making way or underway not making way. If you have a line to a pier and you're springing off the dock and you're using your engines to get out from the middle of maybe two vessels, as long as you've got that line springing off the dock, you are still moored. But once you take the line off, 
you are underway. Okay, so just remember underway, you're not attached to the earth in any way. The, the words length and breadth, you'll see these general definitions on the test. And some people do miss these just because of the wording. So make sure you study those. The words length means her length overall. So if you had to put her in a box or a dry dock from tip to stern, that would be her length overall. And her greatest breadth is her breadth. So similarly, if you had to put her in a box, well, what's the greatest breadth that you would need uh, as far as wide goes, the beam of the vessel? Uh, letter K, vessel shall be deemed to be in sight of one another only when one can be observed visually from the other. So there are certain rules that apply only when you're in sight of one another. And when we say in sight, typically we mean you observe them visually with your eyes. Now, you could possibly look at the radar and then look out and see them. Sure, that's great. But if you don't see them visually, you only see them on radar, you're not in sight. If you see them with your eyes or even with binoculars, that is in sight. Uh, L, the term restricted visibility, means any condition in which visibility is restricted by fog, mist, falling snow, heavy rainstorms, or sandstorms. Uh, or any similar causes. Now, I always think of uh, restricted visibility as natural causes, like something maybe weather related. And the reason I think of it like that is because uh, nighttime is not con a considered restricted visibility. Nighttime happens pretty much every day, especially here, not in all parts of the world, but generally uh, at night we turn on our lights and so on. But um, it's not considered restricted visibility. And then they give a definition for wing and ground craft, and we really don't need to focus on that too much besides knowing what light it shows, and we'll cover that later. Now, letter N on the inland side says, Western Rivers means the Mississippi, its tributaries, South Pass, and Southwest Pass. And then it goes into a little bit more deeper about that. For, for our test and probably for the Coast Guard test, just remember that any rules that apply on the Western Rivers is going to be the Mississippi and its tributaries. Uh, letter O. Now, this one has gotten people uh, on a couple of exams. Great Lakes. The Great Lakes means Great Lakes and their connecting and tributary waters, including the Calumet River, as far as the Thomas O'Brien Lock and Controlling Works, the Chicago River, as far as the east side of the Ashland Avenue Bridge, and the St. Lawrence River, as far east as the lower exit of the St. Lambert Lock. Now, I have seen some people miss that question just because they get into a little detail about um, the St. Lawrence River and what applies there. I think that is the question is um, which of the following is considered part of the Great Lakes uh, and the St. Lawrence River is the, the question's uh, answer that they're looking for. Uh, P, we mentioned earlier the secretary may issue a certificate of alternative compliance, and I never said who the secretary is. Well, here it is. The secretary means the secretary of the department in which the U.S. Coast Guard is currently operating. So they leave it generic because the Coast Guard works for whatever the nation needs at that moment. So in the past, the Coast Guard might have worked for the Department of Transportation, after 9-11, they stood up what's called Homeland Security, and the Coast Guard became part of Homeland Security. So they left that generic so they don't have to change the rules very often. It's kind of like the Constitution. You don't want to have a whole bunch of changes to it. So they said the secretary. Uh, letter Q, inland waters. Inland waters means the navigable waters of the United States shoreward of the navigation demarcation line. So I'm going to show you an example. I don't have a chart uh, to show you right now, but I'm going to show you an example of that. And I'll just kind of draw it up and you can visualize, especially those people that are here in Virginia will kind of understand the reference. But if you are taking a U.S. Coast Guard exam, um, the Chesapeake Bay chart is one that is used. So you should be familiar with that. So excuse my drawings right off the bat. I'll do my best. So let's say we've got coastal Virginia here. This is Virginia Beach, okay? And this is Cape Henry, okay? And then we have the Eastern Shore, and this is Cape Charles, all right? Now, this is Cape Charles Light, and this is Cape Henry Light, okay? On this particular chart, the line of demarcation runs from 
uh, Cape Charles to Cape Henry. Okay, this is called the Colregs demarcation line. Now, if you are on this side of that line, that is international rules of the road. Okay, if you are on the shoreward side of that line, you are in the inland rules of the road jurisdiction. Okay. That line is the demarcation that switches from international, if you're inbound, to inland. So even here off of the coast of Virginia Beach, that is considered international as far as the rules of the road. Now, this has nothing to do with territorial waters or uh, economic zones or anything like that. Generally, the high seas are outside of our territorial waters, but it is an assumed thought that anything outside of the demarcation line would be considered international for the rules of the road. So just remember, if you're coming in from being out at Chesapeake Light, you're doing some fishing or you're, you're coming in on your ship, as you cross over these two lights in line uh, on your track, that will be the demarcation line going from international to inland. Okay. So we're going to turn the page and now we're going to talk about rule number four. Uh, rule number four is the application of conduct of vessels in any condition of visibility. So meaning clear, restricted, and so on. Rule five is probably one of the shorter rules in the book or probably one of the most important. And this is the lookout rule. And the main thing you need to think about when you think about the lookout rule, it says every vessel shall now, this is the first time we're really hearing that kind of emphasized. Every vessel shall. That means you must. Okay, It doesn't leave any room for interpretation or whether you feel like it or not. You have to do it at all times. So that's 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Every vessel shall at all times maintain proper lookout by sight and hearing. So I've got to look and I've got to listen. All right. Uh, as well as all available means appropriate to the prevailing circumstances and conditions so as to make a full appraisal of the situation and of the risk of collision. So if you think about how can you maintain a proper lookout, well, you might have someone out there with some binoculars looking around, scanning the horizon. Uh, you might have a VHF radio turned up so you can listen to vessel traffic that might be um, broadcasting over uh, the radio. Uh, you may have a vessel traffic service in the area that's going to tell you certain vessels are getting underway at certain times and where you might meet those vessels in the channel. And then something that came out after 9-11, which is amazing, is AIS, Automated Identification System, um, which gives you uh, identification information about vessels that might be out there, what their course and speed is, where they're coming from, where they're going to, and so on. But generally, it tells us that the vessel is out there. Uh, and then also radar. If your vessel is equ equipped with radar, uh, you need to observe it and make sure that you're looking and adjusting it and tuning it properly so that you can see targets, even small ones that might be out there. So it's very important that you understand the lookout rule has to be maintained at all times. Uh, and it needs to be in a situation where you can actually focus on being the lookout. So if you start to get distracted by a, you know, a small fire in your engine or uh, the company's calling you on the phone or whatever else, your cell phone rings, you've got to make sure that if you can't do the job, you get someone else up there that can do lookout duties and focus on that alone. Okay, rule six. Rule six, pages 12 and 13. Rule six is probably one of the main things that causes accidents out there, and it is called safe speed. And this is a judgment. So nobody can tell you what safe speed is. It's kind of a judgment call based on your situation. And it says every vessel shall at all times proceed at a safe speed so that she can be stopped, uh, so, so that she can take proper and effective action to avoid collision and be stopped within a distance appropriate to the prevailing circumstances and conditions. In determining safe speed, the following factors shall be taken into account. So these are the things that you should use to determine if you're going a safe speed. The state of visibility, probably the most important one. How far can you see? If I look out and I see no one out there, I can probably crank it up a little bit. But if it's, you know, 4th of July and I've got a lot of recreational boaters or there's a, a, a sailing regatta out there, I need to slow down. Okay. 
Uh, traffic density, including concentration of fishing vessels. We just talked about that. If there's a lot of vessels out there, you, do, you generally need to slow down. The maneuverability of the vessel with reference to stopping distance and turning ability. So one of the ships I was on, you know, many years ago was a uh, 600 feet single screw, no bow thruster or anything. Um, wasn't very maneuverable at all. And then I was on a much smaller ship, maybe 200 feet, uh, twin engine, bow thruster, it was like a Cadillac. So we've got to consider how these types of vessels will maneuver while we're out there uh, and then make our safe speed determination from that. Um, the one thing that it does not mention there is your maximum speed. And I do <clears throat> remember there's a question on the test that, that talks about when determining safe speed, which of the following would not be a consideration. And that answer is always the maximum horsepower of your vessel because we don't really care how fast you can go, right? That's not going to be a determining factor to determine safe speed. Now, you might think of it in a sense of how quickly you can get out of a situation, but they didn't list that here as far as a factor. So maximum horsepower or maximum speed would be the answer for a question that says which one is not considered when determining safe speed. Uh, IV, uh, Roman numeral IV, at night, the presence of background lights, such as shore lights or backscatter from her own lights. So many ports that I've been into, uh, typically we've arrived uh, just at or before sunrise. And so when you're coming into a place, and you may or may not be familiar with that place, uh, and you're looking at the background lights from the town or the city, and like here you see the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, you know, it's many, many miles of lights. You have two different channels that have buoy markers. So you have all those lights blinking, different patterns. Then you have, you know, hotels or you have homes that have lights. All of that stuff can get you know, disorienting if you, if you aren't super familiar with that area. So if you do feel that you're not quite comfortable with the speed that you're making, looking at all of those uh, lights with the backscatter, slow down. Okay. That's always a safe bet. The state of wind, sea, and current and proximity of navigation hazards. So this is very important. Some vessels are, you know, significantly, um, moved by wind and some with a very large displacement might be moved by current. So you've got to think about how those winds and currents and other uh, weather, sea state and all that affects your vessel and whether you might need to slow down a little bit. And then the last one, the draft in relation to the available depth of the water. So if you're going you know, extremely fast and you suddenly enter uh, shallow water, you could ground yourself because of squat, uh, a couple of other different reasons, but you've got to think about that when you go from deeper water to more, more shallow water for your vessel. Letter B says, additionally, by vessels with an operational radar, these are the things you want to consider. First, the characteristics, efficiency, and limitations of the radar equipment. So <clears throat> there are two different types of radars generally in marine use, the uh, X-band and the S-band. So if you're cruising along and a big rain squall comes by, your X-band radar might be useless, right? You've got a big you know, green area on your scope, you can't really see contacts under it. Let's say that's the only one that you have on board. Well, you want to make sure that you slow down. That way, if someone does pop out from under that rain squall, you can react uh, appropriately. So if you're going too fast, thinking, oh, there's no one out there, and at the last minute, a small skiff or something like that pops up in front of you, uh, you'll be going too fast to react, and you might actually run them over, possibly killing someone. So uh, think about your radar limitations. Uh, any constraints with the radar range scale, uh, the effect of radar detection on sea state, weather, and other uh, sources of interference. Interference might be another vessel that's operating close by that's uh, causing your signal to be weaker. Uh, the possibility that small vessels, ice, and other floating objects may not be detected by radar uh, at an adequate range. So vessels that have very low freeboard, uh, fiberglass vessels, sailing vessels, Sometimes those vessels are very difficult to pick up on radar. So you want to slow down to make sure you can give yourself time to react. The number, location, and movement of vessels detected by radar. So if I'm just watching one uh, target on a radar scope, that's probably pretty easy. But if I've got 15 or 20 uh, little pips on my screen, I'm going to think again as far as how fast I'm going so that I can manage uh, those contacts and make sure that I stay safe. And then the last one, the more exact assessment of visibility that may be possible when radar is used to determine the range of vessels and other objects 
in the vicinity. So sometimes we could use radar uh, to put it on a PIP or contact our aids navigation and mark the distance and kind of get a good idea of how far uh, that vessel is away or, or even our visibility at that point. So just remember safe speed is a judgment call. They don't give you a speed number in the book, but you do have to make sure that you consider it when you're determining how much uh, propulsion you want to ring up. So the next page is rule seven. We've got three more and we'll take a break. Uh, risk of collision. Every vessel shall use all available means appropriate to the prevailing circumstances and conditions to determine if risk of collision exists. If there is any doubt, such risk shall be deemed to exist. So you're cruising along and there's a vessel out there and you're not 100% what's going to happen or you're feeling uneasy about it, always assume that you're going to have a collision or that there is a risk of collision. So that way you take action. If you just kind of look at them and you're not really sure what's going on, but you just keep going towards that target, uh, that other vessel, mm -hmm. you could put yourself in a very bad situation. So always err on the side of safety, like just assume the worst and take action. Uh, B, proper use shall be made of radar equipment if fitted and operational, including long-range scanning to obtain early warning of risk of collision and radar plotting or equivalent systematic observation of detected objects. So what this means is if you have radar on board it, and it works, it needs to be on and you need to observe it, right? You need to be looking at it. Uh, a lot of times uh, vessel uh, operators will think, okay, well, I've got a radar, but it's perfectly beautiful out here. I see everything there is to see. So they won't turn it on. They'll save it for when they need it. Well, that is not uh, okay according to the rules of the road. Uh, it's not even okay if you have two radars that you keep one in standby and one uh, transmitting. If they're on your vessel and their operation, they need to be on. And like it said here, you need to use long range scanning, right? You need to go out and in. So maybe I'm on a three mile scale and I go out to a 12 mile scale. Uh, temporarily bring it back in. You know, I'm looking in and out to make sure I see everyone. C, assumptions shall not be made on the basis of scanty information, especially scanty radar information. So I'm thinking of something like you see a PIP one time, but then you don't see it again, and you start making course changes based on information that you don't really know exists. That might be what they're talking about there. And letter D is definitely one of those harder questions that you'll see on the exam. So I'm going to draw it up here for you. And what they're talking about here is called uh, when you have a target that is on a constant bearing and decreasing range, the chance that you might hit each other. Okay. So let's say, for example, it says in determining if risk of collision exists, the following considerations shall be taken into account. Letter I, such risk shall be deemed to exist if the compass bearing of an approaching vessel does not appreciably change. So let's say I have my vessel here, okay? And I look over and I see a crossing vessel here and I take a bearing to that vessel and that bearing might be uh, zero, four, zero. And maybe they're at two miles. So at two nautical miles, okay? So it's 11.30, I'm looking at them, I see them. I'm like, okay, I'm trying to figure out what's going on with them. And later at 11.40, Okay, here I am, and now the vessel is here. I take another bearing, and the vessel is at 040, but now it's at 1.7 nautical miles. That right there is called C, B, D, R. Constant bearing with a decreasing range. constant bearing decreasing range. The bearing did not change, but the range did. That is a collision, okay? Constant bearing decreasing range. That will end up in a collision. Now you say, well, how can I take a bearing? You don't really need to have a compass, particularly on board to take a bearing, um, but you can use a window pane. So I look out the window pane and the target is in the right side of the right window pane. And when I go back out there, the target's in the same position. That's CBDR. Um, if I went out there and I saw them in the right window pane the first time, but now they're in my middle window, okay, that target's going to pass ahead of you. Probably going to be okay. That is not CBDR. If it changes from where you first saw it to where you see it later, 
In that case, it had left bearing drift. It's going to pass ahead of you. If it started off off on your, you know, starboard bow, and now it's on your starboard uh, beam closer to that, it's going to pass behind you. The one that we're most concerned about is this one, CBDR, constant bearing, decreasing range. Now, the test question that gets most people is letter II. The next one, it says, such risk may, and this is where I would highlight in my book, may sometimes exist even when appreciable bearing change is evident, particularly when approaching a very large vessel or a tow or when approaching a vessel at close range. So I just think of this as maybe like that cruise ship again, that's you know really, really large. And I take a bearing to the ship, to the front of it, and a couple minutes, you know, maybe five or 10 minutes later, I take another bearing and it's changed you know, two or three degrees, maybe even five degrees. Well, the front of that ship moved enough to have bearing drift, but the ship is so large that I could still hit the vessel midships or maybe somewhere around the stern. And the same concept goes with a tow. Um, just because you have bearing drift does not always mean that you're not going to hit each other. It just means that um, you probably should watch it and you could clear the vessel, but if it's large or at close range, you still have a risk of collision, even if it has slight bearing drift. So remember, this is CBDR, constant bearing decreasing range. Um, that is a risk of collision, and you could still have it. They, they use the word may if you have a large vessel uh, that's close to you or a vessel in tow. Okay, rule eight, action to avoid collision. A, any action taken to avoid collision shall be taken in accordance with the rules, and it has to be three things. Uh, it needs to be uh, positive, made in ample time, and with due regard to the observance of good seamanship. So when they say positive, they mean whatever action that you take, it should fix the situation, not just do small changes that you're still in a risk of collision, but you did something. That's not what they want, right? They want it to be positive, so a positive outcome. And it needs to be done in ample time. So if you're a procrastinator, this is not for you, right? Uh, you want to make sure that you're doing it right away. As soon as you recognize there is a risk of collision, do something. And then uh, with due regard to the observance of good seamanship, so if you're in a cross crossing situation, good seamanship would be to come to the right and go behind that vessel. A lot of collisions happen because vessels decide to speed up and cross the bow of another vessel, which is almost never a good thing. So just use that good seamanship rule when you're trying to figure out what action you should take. So they kind of give you some ideas of things you should do. Uh, letter B says any alteration of course and or speed to avoid collision shall, if circumstances of the case admit, be large enough to be readily apparent to another vessel observing visually or by radar. A succession of small alterations of course or speed should be avoided. That makes sense, right? You don't want to do a two or three degree course change and that vessel is a couple miles away looking at you wondering, are you going to do anything? They should see aspect change. They should see your PIP change on the radar. They should see your light characteristics change, you know, different angle. Um, make it obvious. So I would say, you know, more than 10 degrees, right? It needs to be more than 10 degrees, maybe even 20 degrees, and several uh, knots if you're changing the speed, okay? And or both. Now it says small alterations, of course, or speed should be avoided. There are some test questions that mention, you know, you're in a situation with another vessel, which of the following actions should you take? And a lot of students, for some reason, will choose change speed slightly. Well, slightly means small or a little bit. We don't want that. So that's never going to be the answer. Anything in the rules as far as a choice on a test that mentions doing something small is always going to be wrong. So just remember that. Don't choose the small options. It says, if there is sufficient sea room, an alteration of course alone may be the most effective action to avoid a close quarter situation, provided that it's made in good time, is substantial, and does not result in another close quarter situation. Generally, when people are taking, or vessels are taking action to avoid something or to get out of the way of another vessel, um, generally it's a course change and we just maintain our speed and come on around. That's okay a lot of the times. Um, but just realize that it needs to be big enough to where they can see that you did something. And also don't put yourself into another close quarter situation. And that happens sometimes, especially at a busy waterway or at night when you're not actually um, taking into consideration the angles of all the vessels that are around you.
Uh, letter D, action taken to avoid collision with another vessel shall be such as to result in a safe passing distance. The effectiveness of the action shall be carefully checked until the vessel is finally passed and clear. So if you go around someone, give them some cushion, right? Don't just uh, go around them and then almost clip their bow as you're getting back into uh, the channel. And that happens. It's kind of like when you're driving on a highway, people go around you very closely. It's very dangerous. So you don't want to do that. Uh, letter E, if necessary, uh, to avoid collision or allow more time to assess the situation, a vessel shall slacken her speed or take all the way off by stopping or reversing her means of propulsion. So at any time, if you are unsure of the situation or you're feeling uneasy about the situation, stop, slow down, reverse if you have to. Let other vessels go around you and they may wonder what the heck you're doing and that's okay. But remember, you will not lose your license by stopping and letting other vessels go around you to give your time more time, yourself more time to assess the situation. Slow down, stop, get out of the way, whatever you can do. But don't just keep plowing up that channel because you feel like somebody's behind you, right? Don't let someone else influence your actions. Okay, that's rule eight. Now, rule nine and ten are very similar, and we'll talk about the differences in them. And that'll be the end of this section. I'll cover narrow channels and traffic separation schemes. Okay. So when we talk about a narrow channel, a uh, narrow channel is relative depending on the vessel. You know, some channels are really large and most any vessel can fit down it. And other channels are pretty small that even the smallest wreck boat would have a tough time. But generally we're talking about a fairway that's in open water. Um, that's a route that goes to a port that does not have any hazards to navigation in it. So I'm thinking like going into Houston, there are fairways that are carved out on the chart where oil uh, rigs are not allowed to be uh, positioned because it allows for safe navigation. Well, within these narrow channels or fairways, um, there are some certain rules for it, okay? So first, uh, let's look at the inland side because there is a little bit more details on the inland side that we need to, to focus on because there's definitely a test question from uh, section A. So A1, or excuse me, AI says, a vessel proceeding along the course of a narrow channel or fairway shall keep as near to the outer limit of the channel or fairway which lies on her starboard side. That makes total sense. That's how we drive, right? We stay to the right. Now, this is where the test question comes in. It's typically an all of the above answer. It says, notwithstanding paragraph AI and rule 14, a power driven vessel operating in a narrow channel or fairway on the Great Lakes, Western Rivers, remember that's the Mississippi, and waters specified by the secretary, one, proceeding downbound with a, with a following current shall have the right of way over an upbound vessel. That makes sense. If I am proceeding downbound with a following current, I am going to be less in control of how that vessel maneuvers because I've got that following current coming into my prop. So she is going to have right of way over an upbound vessel. So I may just call you up and say, hey, hang out over to the right, stem the current until I get by you. That's okay. Um, number two, shall propose the manner and place of passage. So I'm going to say whether I want to port to port or starboard to starboard if I'm downbound. And I'm going to say where? I'm going to say, okay, in the vicinity of buoys 14 and 15, we're going to pass port to port. And three, shall initiate the maneuvering signals prescribed by Rule 34, which we'll get to that later. So there is test questions regarding this, and it discusses um, vessels proceeding downbound with the following current. And it'll say that uh, she will have the right of way, she will propose the manner in place, and she will initiate the maneuvering signals or all of the above. And typically for that question, the answer is all of the above because it's true. Okay. Now here's where we get into some of the details for rule nine, which is narrow channel. Okay. Rule nine, narrow channel. Okay. There are some very specific things. All right. So letter B says a vessel of less than 20 meters in length or a sailing vessel shall not impede the passage of a vessel that can only safely navigate within a narrow channel. So I'm going to kind of summarize this. So a vessel less than 20 meters 
a sailing vessel, remember that's under sail alone, okay, shall not impede the passage of a vessel that has to be in that narrow channel or fairway. Now letter C, they continue it on, and it says a vessel engaged in fishing shall not impede the passage of any vessel in the narrow channel, okay? So there is a slight difference where this part says only if the vessel has to be in the channel, fishing vessel says any, you know, can, fishing vessels can't get in the way of anyone. And the idea is they don't really want uh, fishing vessels in a narrow channel or fairway. Remember, that's nets, lines, and trawls. So we don't want vessels in there putting out long lines. Can they do it? Sure, but they can't impede the traffic of any vessel that's there. But I just kind of keep it more simple. And I remember for rule nine, vessels less than 20 meters, sailing and fishing vessels just have to stay out of the way. Okay. We want to just kind of remember these three for the test because there will be some questions that relate to rule nine in a narrow channel. And it'll say who has to stay out of the way of who. Okay. So remember those vessel less than 20 meters, a sailing vessel and fishing generally are the ones that are going to stay out of the way. Now, letter D says a vessel shall not cross a narrow channel or fairway if crossing impedes the passage of a vessel that can only navigate within the channel or fairway. The latter vessel must use the signals in Rule 34 if in doubt. And we'll talk about that later. So generally, if you are going to cross a channel, let the other, the other vessel go ahead before you cross. Uh, jump down to letter F. A vessel nearing a bend or an area of a narrow channel or fairway where other vessels may be obscured by an intervening obstruction shall navigate with particular alertness and caution and shall sound the appropriate signal in 34E, which we'll talk about that later, but it's one prolonged blast. So I'm going to let them know, hey, I, I'm proceeding along this channel and there's a bend in it and I can't see you. So I'm going to indicate to you that I'm here and then you're going to indicate that you're there. So we're going to talk to each other. So the last rule that we're going to cover in this section is rule number 10 and rule number 10 is traffic separation schemes and there are numerous traffic separation schemes around the world. Uh, there is one here at the entrance to the Chesapeake Bay, there's uh, New York, uh, up in Rhode Island, there's a, a couple of lanes. So these rules only apply in a traffic separation scheme. So looking at pages 20 and 21, uh, it starts off by saying this rule applies to traffic separation schemes and do not relieve any vessel of her obligation under any other rule. BI, a vessel using a traffic separation scheme shall proceed in the appropriate traffic lane in the general direction of traffic flow for that lane. So that means if it's an inbound lane, you should be heading inbound. If it's outbound, you should be going outbound. So far as practicable, keep clear of a traffic separation line or separation zone. What that means is in the traffic separation scheme, there's an inbound and an outbound lane. There's a purple or magenta area in between those two lanes. And this is an area where they want you to kind of steer clear of and stay to the right of your uh, inbound or outbound lane and not crowd the center because it might be someone that's heading outbound or overtaking another vessel. And if you're crowding that separation uh, zone, it might uh, put yourself in a head-on situation with another vessel. I, I, I normally join or leave a traffic lane at the termination of the lane, but when joining or leaving from either side, do so at a small angle to the general direction of traffic flow. And that basically is saying that you would join a lane exactly how you would get on a highway. You merge into the highway at a small angle, get your speed up, and then join the traffic uh, as you normally would. It's the same for a vessel. Uh, letter C. A vessel shall, so far as practicable, avoid crossing lanes, but if obliged to do so, shall cross on a heading as nearly as practicable at right angles to the general direction of traffic flow. Now, obviously, you wouldn't want to uh, cross in front of another vessel, but if the, if the lane was clear and it was okay to cross, they want you to do that as quickly as possible, which is why they say to cross at a 90-degree angle. It gets you across that lane quickly. Now, jumping down... Um, to letter G, it says a vessel shall, so far as practicable, avoid anchoring in a traffic separation scheme at or near its termination. That makes sense, right? We don't want you anchoring where there's going to be inbound and outbound traffic. And then the bottom two, 
uh, letters are probably where most of your test questions are going to come from. Uh, letter uh, I and J. So I says a vessel engaged in fishing shall not impede the passage of any vessel following a traffic lane. So same as before. Okay. So we've got rule 10, which is our TSS. Okay. And it said that a fishing vessel will not impede any vessel in the lane. Not impede any vessel using traffic separation scheme. And the reason for that is they don't want uh, fishing vessels uh, putting out long lines or uh, impeding traffic flow. And so, yes, it is uh, permissible to fish in the traffic separation scheme, but it's not recommended because there's typically a lot of traffic in that area. And then the last one, a vessel of less than 20 meters or a sailing vessel shall not impede the safe passage of a power-driven vessel following the lane. So it's the exact same as what we saw up here for Rule 9. So sailing and less than 20. Uh, sailing vessel and a vessel less than 20 meters shall not impede a power-driven vessel in the lane. So do not impede a power-driven vessel following the traffic separation scheme. So if you could just remember those three vessels when it comes to Rule 9 and Rule 10, um, you know, fishing, sailing, and less than 20, those are the general overall questions. It may say you are following a narrow channel and you're in a power-driven vessel. Which of the following vessels have to keep out of the way? Well, you're looking for one of those three, sailing, less than 20, or fishing. Uh, and those are usually going to be your answer. So now this is narrow channel and traffic separation scheme. If they're talking about um, hierarchy of vessels or who has to get out of the way of the other uh, in open waters, that's rule 18. So that's a little bit different. We'll cover that next. But um, as far as rule 9 and rule 10, uh, the gist of it, especially for traffic separation schemes, join at a small angle, cross at a 90 degree angle, uh, and then fishing vessels have to stay out of everyone's way. Obviously, we don't want them using nets, lines, and trawls in a traffic separation scheme. And then sailing vessels and vessels less than 20, the smaller vessels, should stay out of the way of power-driven vessels using the lane. Okay, that's the conclusion of the first uh, set of rules that we're going to cover. So that was rules 1 through 10. Uh, the next video will start uh, with rule 11, and we'll continue through rule 19. All right, thank you.